Let's focus in our attention on Jesus Christ today in this passage in Mark chapter 15. Let's start with a quote. Uh, This meat is as tender as a shoe, as a leather shoe. This meat, this piece of meat is as tender as a leather shoe. Another statement. Last night, the fire station burnt to the ground. What do these two statements have in common? This piece of meat is as tough as a leather shoe. You know, last night, the fire station bro- burnt to the ground. You know what they have in common? Irony. They're both packed full of irony. Irony is a powerful way to communicate one, where one's meaning communicates actually the opposite. So if I say, oh, this is meat so tender, it's like a, as tender as a leather shoe. What am I communicating? It's not tender. When I say, oh, the fire, how, the fire station burned down last night, how ironic. It's a situational irony. One is a verbal irony. One is a situational irony. You remember Toy Story, where the, where the toys are alive, but nobody knows it? All the people don't know that toys are alive? That is dramatic irony. And so now when we look, we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. Mark, in his perspective, he wants us to hear something from the irony. Today, we'll worship the Lord in this morning and then in this evening. In the morning, we're going to look at verses 25 to 32, the first three hours of the cross. Tonight, we'll focus in on verses 33 to 37, the last three hours of the cross. In the first three hours on the cross... Mark uses irony. It's the text is packed full of irony, situational irony and um, verbal irony, even dramatic irony, in order to communicate something powerful to us. Jesus, we won't hear from Jesus this morning. We'll hear from Jesus' enemies. And God, in his amazing wisdom, will teach us something about the gospel from the voices and the situations of Jesus' enemies. So hear the good news today. Hear the good news today, not from Jesus' voice, but God using his enemy's voice to preach the good news to us. In our text, in verses 25 to 32, we'll hear the gospel according to Jesus' enemies. First, in verses 25, if you look on the outline that you have in your bulletin, verses 25 to 27... We're going to see the setting, the setting of Christ's crucifixion. And in the setting, we see great irony. And then in verses 29 to 32, we hear Jesus was mocked as he was crucified. And from his enemies, from their mocking, in the irony of their mocking, we hear the gospel. So there could be no greater story than this good old story that I get to say to you today. We get to worship the Lord. So let's go in and remember this good old story. As we're coming up into, into Mark 15 here, we, we see that in verses 1 to 5, Jesus comes before Pilate and he almost says nothing. Mark doesn't really tell us much about what Jesus says. It's just a simple little statement in verse 2 that he affirms what Pilate is saying about uh, his, his um, being king of the Jews. It's as you say. It's the briefest statement possible that Jesus could give to affirm when Pilate's question about whether he's the king of the Jews. And then in verses 6 to 15, Jesus and Barabbas are, uh, Jesus takes Barabbas' place. And what a picture of substitutionary atonement. In verses 16 to 20, we come to the scourging of Jesus Christ, where he is treated as a criminal. And then in verses 21 to 24, we have the, the true via, uh, via de la Rosa, or the true way of suffering, the true road to the cross. And then in verses 25 to 32, we come to the first three hours of the cross. And so in this time, 
is when Jesus will, when he's on the cross in this time, is when he'll pray things, such things as Luke tells us, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And in this prayer, he expresses a desire for his enemies to be saved. And what a contrast we have here between the way Jesus is living, acting, speaking, and what his enemies are doing. In this text, it is a great display of the wickedness and the sinfulness of men. So first, in verses 25 to 27, we read about the, the setting of the cross. Read, with it, read, read it again with me. In verse 25, Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his crucifixion was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So when we come to verse 25, it describes the timing and the state, the reality, what's happened. So first we look at the timing. Now it was the third hour. This provides us the background we need. Remember in the in the, the way that the gospel writers, Matthew, the first three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that they describe the timing of the events around the cross, they use a different time frame than what we use when we look at the clock. So here, when he says the third hour, this is the third hour after the sun has risen. Okay, so it's about 9 o'clock. About 9 o'clock our time. And so... Mark, noting the time, remember that the, in time in the ancient world is not like we have time, like we've got a timer on our phone or a timer on the, on the clock. They're, just go, they're going by estimates by where the sun is at, right? So if you, you consider the sun rising is the first hour and you've got the, the six hours right when the sun is right above, above you, they right, remember the sun is somewhere right in between, in between right coming up and right above you. And they say more or less – that the, that was the timing, and Mark. So Mark notes that for us, and so uh, we remember now not only the timing, but then what does it mean? And they crucified him. And so I'm going to explain some of that cultural background, some of that what that means, because in all, for us to read it, we don't understand the same thing that Mark's audience would understand. Likely, Mark's audience is in Rome, and that they're, uh, when they read this, they don't need any explanation. They know well what it means. And so, I'm just going to remind you some of what it means when Jesus is crucified, or what it means in that short statement in verse 25. Crucifixion was a very common way of, of execution. The Romans used it in a particular way to communicate fear, to communicate a sense of humiliation, and a sense that Rome rules with an iron fist. The Romans didn't develop this form of, of execution, but we can say that they perfected it. And, and made it very common. In AD 70, you remember that, that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. This is like some 35 years, more or less, after Jesus Christ. And the, the historian Josephus tells us that they crucified so many people, they ran out of wood. That when, when they would crucify many people, they would sometimes make a scaffolding in order to crucify people. So a great um, structure of wood in order to crucify many people to it. They crucify people in different ways. Sometimes it'd be like an X. Sometimes it's like a traditional cross, like a, like a lowercase t. Sometimes it's like an uppercase t. They, the form could change depending on what suited the, the people the best. The crucified person was, was required to carry the, the plank or the whole thing to their place of execution. They typically would wear their, uh, with a plaque or carry, or somebody else would carry the plaque, a wooden plaque, typically. 
perhaps sometimes painted white with red letters, black letters, and it would have the person's crime on it. And so that on the road, then everyone would know publicly. That crucifixions would take place in public places so that as many people could see it as possible. Rome wanted to communicate to the people the, the horror of opposing Rome. Jesus was nailed to the cross. We know that by how he, did, in John 20, how it describes the marks, that he showed the marks in his resurrection that he received. But some people are tied to the cross, crosses. Then the Jewish mind, when the Jew would see a cross, they would think of Deuteronomy 21. Cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. Cursed by God is anyone who hangs on a tree. So when they would see someone, they'd say, they would think, this person's cursed by God. Crucifixion was, in the, when they would typically nail, the nails would not go through the palm of the hand that would rip out. They'd typically go, you know, you've got two bones here, right, in your hand, and you've got the wrist bone. Typically goes in here, in between these two bones, and they can still consider that part of the hand, what we would consider the wrist. You have a nerve here, cyanic nerve, that it goes, the, bone, the nails would typically be long nails, six, seven inches long, iron, and then they go through this nerve. And so then they would, they found a, a Jewish body of a, um, where the, the long nail goes through the, both heel bones on the feet. And so they place the two heels together. And then the nail is going through the, um, that heel bone, or perhaps one lapped up on the other. But the body, the evidence, the archaeological evidence we have is um, through the heel bone. Sometimes there'd be a seat, like where the person could rest, perhaps um, their backside on it. Um, but no, the, the death would come by exhaustion and suffocation. Not by so much the nails, not so much by the... The idea is to keep you alive as long as possible so that you suffer as long as possible. In order to breathe and that like that, you've got to lift yourself up on your nails and your, and your wrists and on your feet. And so you can't breathe when you're down. You got to lift yourself up to breathe and you slide back down until you got to breathe again. And so there's a constant moving, a constant torture, and a constant um, rubbing against the, the wood until you're too exhausted and you can't lift yourself up to breathe anymore. Often, uh, the, it would take days to die. Crucifixions normally took place with the person naked. Sometimes the Jews hated this. They opposed it. We don't know whether Jesus was allowed a loincloth or no, or not. Um, so, but the, um, it's all part of the shame of the event. Victims would often take, um, like I said, days to die. Sometimes birds, dogs would come in while the person is dying and try and eat the person. The muscle, muscles would often have spasms because on riding a nurse, so the person could shake uncontrollably at times. In Roman society, people didn't like to say the word. Uh, cross, crucifixion. If you're in polite society, you're not going to talk about it. You're not going to say it. It's considered a curse word. Because people know what comes to, to mind, what what's taking place. For us, it's like um, something in a story, right? For them, it was something that they had seen. Somebody, some face, some voice they heard screaming. It was... Brutal. It was common. It was for those who opposed Rome.
crosses were not normally that high. Sometimes um, the people were just off and not high enough off the ground. Jesus' cross was a little higher. We know that because they got a, in order to give him something to drink, they put on the end of a stick. So they get a rod, stick, dip it, oh, sponge, and they, are, they lift up to his mouth. So his cross is a little higher. And if they would do that, that would be so he could be seen farther away, more of a public display. The fact that Jesus is crucified is attested by uh, five other secular historians. Um, the Bible is the word of God, and God's good enough to tell you that, that and he never lies. But if you need to know, yeah, there's five other historians and, um, that record Jesus, the fact that Jesus Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth, died on a cross outside Jerusalem. So this is the setting. This is what Mark, when he communicates and they crucified him, that everybody in his audience would immediately know these things. And so I tell them to you, um, this, the physical suffering that Jesus faced is not the point. Uh, that's not what Mark wants us to focus in on. But, I, but it's important for you to understand the historical background. It's important to understand these things. There's something greater than that that God wants us to hear. We pick up again in verse 27, or 26 rather, the setting around the cross. And so we read in verse 26, and the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. Like I described, this would be part of the wooden plaque that Jesus would have had to carry around his neck as it, or some, a Roman soldier carries with him holding up. In some way, they bring it. And in some way, they place it above his head. And because they place it above his head, and the gospel writers tell us this in Matthew 27, 37, and in John 19, 19, says it was fastened to the cross. It's how we know Jesus was not crucified on an X, but he was crucified likely in the traditional way that we, we communicate the cross, like behind me. And so Mark focuses in on what does the tablet say? What does this plaque say above Jesus' head? He describes the situation for us. He describes the setting for us. And this plaque is to have the basis for or the reason why Jesus is executed. Why was Jesus executed? So that people walk by, they would know. And Mark tells us here that it said the king of the Jews. By reading all the other Gospels and you piece them together, you know that it says completely the whole message was, this is Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. This is Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. In John 19, let's look there very briefly. John 19, verses 20 to 22, we learn the background of why this was written, why was it that this was what was on the plaque, nothing more, nothing less? You remember from going through the Gospel of Mark, this text. John 19, verses 19 to 22. We read, Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, so Pilate wrote it. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. There is the public place again. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So it was written in three languages in order to communicate. Greek, the most common trade language. Hebrew, the language of, the, uh, of Jerusalem, the written language of Jerusalem. And Latin official language of the Roman Empire. They want to communicate to everybody as much as, as clearly as possible. Like at the airport when you got the signs and they're translated into multiple languages. In verse 31, Therefore the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answers, What I've written, I've written. 
Pilate's had enough of the, the religious leaders. He hates the, the discussion. He hates the, the hypocrisy. He's a hypocrite himself. He's a compromiser himself. Two evils coming together. They have a conflict. It's not a surprising thing, right? And so we see these group of evil men and this evil man fighting, squabbling. We return back to Mark. Mark 15. Mark 15, verses 26 to 27. Looking at the setting of the cross. We remember that the, the plaque and the accusation was written in such a way to insult the Jews. Pilate is trying to insult the Jews. Petty revenge. Now verse 27. In verse 27, it reads, With him, describing the setting, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he numbered with the transgressors. So here we have the setting. Jesus is not alone. Jesus has a criminal on his left and right. And Mark uses the term for a violent man, probably associated with Barabbas, the rebellion leader, the terrorist we would use, or term, the term we would use. And these men... Um, are the, the language that Mark uses is one who steals another's property by violence. The language, it's the, the term that the, the Jesus used in the story of the Good Samaritan, with the men who come down and they beat the Good Samaritan and leave him for death. This kind of person. And so one's on the left, one's on the right. The situation is, is telling us Jesus has the, place, most, the highest place of shame. His, his place is not an accident. It's communicating something to us. And so now we've seen this verses 20, 25 to 27. Verse 28 is uh, likely, in the, it's not in the earliest, the most reliable manuscripts. But Luke 22, verse 37, does have this verse. And so in Luke's version, so we know this is scripture. We know this is quoting Isaiah 53, verse 12 communicating the meaning behind the irony. And it says, and he was fulfilled, this is what the scripture says, and he's numbered with the transgressors. So now we've seen the situation. I'm going to describe this scenario to you. Walk through the situation, walk through the words, and then we're going to come back at the end and talk about what they mean. Let's continue to walk through the scene of the cross, the first three hours. Now we're moving away from, in your outline, moving away from the situational irony. Now to hear the voices. Now to hear the words. Now to hear the mocking in verses 29 to 32. Let's walk through again now in verses 29 and 32 to hear again what is just what happened. Then we'll go back. What does it mean? In verse 29, we read, And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So here we recognize these who are described as people who are just passing by, again, they were by the road, were by the, a road. And the general public is expressing a general public rejection of him. They may be affected here by the false teachers, the false religious leaders who are hanging out by the cross. And they are, they read the, the crime over his head and they're in their own pride. They are insulted by the crime. These passerby, people passing by, they read it and they think, this is not my king. What an insult to me. This is one, remember Deuteronomy 21, this is one cursed by God, someone who hangs on a tree. And so, as Mark describes those who, sit, who pass by, he describes them as, as mocking, insulting, reviling, and unknowingly blaspheming by what they do. When they wag their heads like this, 
This is a Jewish way of showing contempt, scorn. It's also describing their arrogance. It's expressing their, he's nothing. I'm better. We're, he's, no, my, he's not my king. Psalm 109 verse 25 describes how uh, it says, I also have become a reproach to them. When they look at me, they shake their heads. Again, the Jew, a Jewish way of, of expressing scorn, mockery. When they say, aha, this is, a, this is an exclamation. It's an emotional, you know how when your emotions um, jump out and it, something comes out of your mouth? This is what the what came like um, like in Spanish in say um, a lot of people in Guatemala when something bad happens like oi oi it's like a uh, it's an emotional exclamation it's just a, it's an emotional thing and out of your mouth comes this phrase and so this what comes out with there with them this aha uh-huh, is an inter it's expressing a sense of of victory of happiness in their scorn it's like look you're getting what you deserve you call you call yourself king of the jews and they quote jesus they talk about and they say in verse 29 you who destroy the temple and build it in three days save yourself and come down from the cross Look back at John chapter 2 and we remember what they are trying to say. John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us? Since you do these things, what Jesus had just done has cleared the temple, taken a whip of cords, driven out of the temple, the money changers, the people who were there to corrupt the temple and gain money out of it, turn the temple into a place of merchandise, prosperity preachers, people trying like people who trying to use the church to get rich. And so Jesus hated it. The evil they were doing. And he hated the evildoers who were doing such a thing. And so he chases them out. And they say, well, what sign? Well, how can you do this? What authority do you have? What shows who you are that you can be able to do this? And he says in verse 19, And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it in three days? But John tells us what he was really talking about. What does John say in verse 21? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. In verse 22, Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So here, back in Mark 15, people are mocking. People who are passing by on the road, they don't know what they're saying. They think they're quoting Jesus. They have a sense of victory over him. And what evil it expresses. That someone would die this way. And then they would mock him as he dies this way. And so we see in verse 30. Someone else is joining in with the mocking. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said he saved others himself he cannot save let the christ the king of israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe in matthew's version in 20 in chapter 27 verse 40 they also add if you are the son of god so in matthew's version they speak to him mark's version they're speaking to each other and by mark's version um It's almost as if you can hear Satan's voice, right? Through the mocking. In the midst of the mocking. He saved others himself he can't save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross. That we may see and believe. In verse 31, 
When we see this likewise, the chief priests, it's like likewise we got another evil group. Likewise, we have another great expression of evil and wickedness. And so they're also mocking. And they seem to be congratulating one another. They seem to be speaking to one another. Patting themselves on the, on the back. In, ver, in Luke 23, 35, they also turn their nose up at him to express their victory and how they're better. What an amazing thing they say in verse 31, right? Others, they say, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. What an amazing thing, right? This could be a sarcastic referral to him, how Jesus, how did he describe how he forgave others or his healing ministry, but, but likely both. Likely both. Look at how they acknowledge the good that he did. It comes out of their own mouths. And then look at how happy they are. Himself he cannot save. In Matthew's version, in, in chapter 27, verse 43, they say, He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I'm the Son of God. We see in verse 32. And they use a third person here. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross. Talking to each other. In Luke 23, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. You, we know they wouldn't believe anyway, right? You remember when Jesus tells the parable of Lazarus and the rich man? Lazarus, the poor man, goes to heaven. Rich man goes to hell. What does Jesus say at the end? When the rich man says, send somebody to go preach to my brothers. Send somebody, send Lazarus, send somebody back from the grave. And what does Jesus say? Now, what does Abraham say in the story? If they don't believe the Bible, they're not going to believe if somebody comes back from the dead. If they don't believe the book God has given, they're not going to believe if somebody came back from the dead. If you, don't, if you don't believe what the Bible says here, you wouldn't believe if your family member came back out of the grave and told you about heaven and hell. And so we know they wouldn't believe anyway. This is just their expression of sin. And so they are speaking in such a way that they're, they're speaking together. To, and they're speaking in such a way to express that he's beneath them. He's lost, they've won. This is an extreme form of shaming him. They're trying to shame him and give him the greatest possible pain. Not just physically, he's suffering that, but now uh, emotionally as well. And so we conclude with, as we see, the passerbyers, those who pass by, mock him. In, verses, in verse 29 and 30, then in verse 31 to 32, the chief priests, the religious leaders mock him. And then at the end of verse 32, it says, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Even those who were being crucified couldn't hold back. They thought of themselves as better than Jesus. They began to mock and... and what an amazing thing, right? They're thinking something like this. Well, we're criminals, but look, he's a fool. He's a fool. They're dying for their cause against, likely against Rome, their rebellion against Rome. But they think, he, what is he dying for? What a fool. Mark doesn't care to tell us about how one repented. That's not his focus. One of those thieves on the cross. And Mark doesn't tell us about how, what Jesus says 
here about committing Mary to John's care. That's not his focus. He's fo- focusing here on all the situation, all the irony. Do you see the meaning behind the irony? Do you see what the, the truth is behind this situation, behind this mocking? This piece of meat is as tough as a leather shoe. What am I saying to you? What, am, what, is, what is the truth behind this irony? What's the, the truth behind this irony? This is what we want to focus in now. I've explained to you the events. The events that take place in the first three hours of the cross. Now let's go back through. Let's go back. Let's rewind. People who won't rewind anymore. Whatever it is you do. <laughs> let's go. You touch your finger and you bring that little line back to the video at the beginning. Let's go back through or hit the restart button the re, you know, on YouTube, right? Whatever, to go back to the beginning. Let's go back and watch it again. And do you get what Mark is telling you? You get what God is telling you through the book of Mark. By using the situation and these voices of mockery. Let's walk through and then you, hopefully you can see some of these applications. Let's look at at verse 26, where they talk about the king of the Jews. Look at how he's mocked. Look at how Pilate wants to insult the Jews. Look at how Pilate wants to communicate something of hate. Look at how the Jews hate it. But look at how God is in control. Of what Pilate writes. So that a truth is declared. By the plaque. What ends up being written. Is the truth. That. Jesus really is the Messiah. He really is the son of David. He really is the king. Of the Jews. He really is. The, um, the one who crushes the serpent's head. And gains victory. And he does this. Vic, gains this cosmic victory. Through the suffering. He rules. As the son of David. Be, through this suffering. Because of this suffering. The plaque that is above his head. Is true. Because he's on the cross. And God is declaring to us that he really is the king. Not just king of the Jews, but king of kings and lord of lords. And that all the universe is his. What an amazing thing that he, the the king of kings, would die. He wears a crown. And they mean to mock him. But he really is, will be crowned. And is is crowned king of kings and lord of lords. Look at how amazing God is. That he could, he would work through evil Pilate. That what Pilate means for all evil, God means for a great good. To tell us something Something that we need to see and something we need to hear. That the, that plaque said the truth. And, and in, as well in verse 32 when the Pharisees say, Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross. He is the King. And displays the fact that he's the King. And is... And is exalted as the mediatorial lordship because of this, this suffering, through this suffering. It's his, this aspect of his kingship comes as a result of his suffering on the cross because of his humiliation and obedience even to the death on the cross. 
The Spirit does not have this aspect of his kingship. The Father does not have this aspect of his mediatorial kingship. The Son alone has this because of his work of staying on that cross. And the the apostles preach in such a way in the book of Acts. And Paul teaches in such a way to communicate this truth in the book of Romans. And in Philippians chapter 2. And so, look at more details. Look at more irony. Don't you get it as you read it through it? Don't you see? They don't, they don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand what they're doing. Look at verse 27. Look at the situational irony. They mean to say, Jesus is the worst of this group by putting him in the middle by putting him with thieves they mean to say this is what happens to those who oppose Rome this is what happens to those who who say that they're the Christ but what is God saying what is God saying by putting him between two criminals Isaiah tells us and he was numbered with the transgressors. He is the true judge. He's condemned at this place between criminals. But he's the one who will judge all the world. God is saying the true judge becomes treated like a criminal. So that you as the true criminal might be saved. He's communicating a substitutionary atonement. He's communicating he's taking the place of evil men. That he would save many. And so being in this place, not just alone, but being between two other criminals and his silence. You notice Jesus didn't say anything. Jesus doesn't say anything when they mock him and when he takes uh, in Mark's account, in Mark's account, when he takes us through chapter 15, there is a great silence. No recording of screaming or suffering, no recording of, of words. And Mark has his silence on purpose to express that Jesus is quiet when they say, You're a blasphemer, You're a, and all the things and the mocking. And why is he silent? Because he's actually innocent, but officially guilty. He's in his true self, and he's actually innocent. But why is he there? To take your place, if you believe in him, and you are guilty. So when he's silent, he's affirming your guilt. And that he's taking your place. He's being numbered. In your place. He's wearing your chains. He's wearing your orange jumpsuit. He's, He's not saying anything. Because he's innocent. But officially. He must be treated as guilty. Do you see what God is saying by putting him between two criminals? He's taking our place. Look at verse 29. Hear the mockery. What is, but what is God saying through this mockery? And they pass by him wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you destroyed the temple and built in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. Jesus is mocked as one who would destroy the physical temple. But because of his work here, he is the true and lasting sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God. The temple existed to point to him. He is the true object of worship. The temple was supposed to be there for people to center around the worship of God and for the sacrifices. He's the fulfillment of all the temple. 
He is the object of worship. We now center around Jesus Christ, not to a place in Jerusalem. And they say to him, you who destroyed the temple and raised in three days. But through this death, through this resur- his resurrection, he is displaying, he is the true temple. They don't know what they're saying. Do you hear what God is saying? Through their mockery. What a, what an, how amazing is our God. That he wouldn't just use apostles to preach the truth. Now he uses his enemies to declare the good news. And they say, save yourself. Verse 30 and 31, save yourself and come down from the cross. And the chief priests also join him. And they say he saved others himself he cannot save. Look at the, the, the true meaning. What is God saying behind them? What an amazing thing that by staying on the cross, by not coming down, he is the Savior. He does display that he is the Christ, the King of the Jews. By doing the exact opposite of what they say, he displays the great truth. And he does them one better. Not just coming down from the cross. He three days later, he rises from the dead. And he rises from the dead. So declaring to all, the victory is his. The sacrifice is accepted. And he is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. So he declares the truth by staying on the cross. Do you have eyes to see, ears to hear what God would have you hear today? This meat is as tough as a leather shoe. What do I I want to tell you? This, This meat is tough. What does God want to tell you through this text? You see the emphasis? Think with me, how should you apply this? Today, we've seen today the first three hours of the cross. And what Mark wants us to hear is great irony. They say all evil and do all evil. But what is God, what good, what great, the greatest good God is doing through this evil? Should we not trust him to in our lives when evil things happen? Should we not trust him that he will work a good for his own people? But shouldn't we do one greater? Shouldn't we trust him for our own souls? Do you see your evil there on the cross? If you do not see that you deserve to die on the cross, you cannot share in the blessings of the cross. It's an easy thing to say, but it is impossible to do. To truly believe that I deserved to die on that cross. That because of, that I'm not just, have not just done bad things, but I am an evil person. To see that truth, to believe that truth, is a gift from God. And I'm declaring to you, you must see it. You must see it, and you must believe it. You must abhor yourself, turn from yourself, and trust in Christ to be your substitute. Trust in Him to save your soul, to forgive you of your sins, and to take you to heaven. What a good Savior we have. Trust in Him. Believe in Him. Repent. Go on in that road. Persevere in that road. Hearing this good news. That's how you would apply today. What does it mean to you today? What should it mean for you today? This text, this good story, this good old story. Just part one. Part two is tonight. Come back. 
if you're at all able, the story does get better. But apply what we've heard and seen this morning. Apply it by enduring the shame. To be named with Christ, you must be shamed today. It's part of walking that Calvary road. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. To say what he said, to walk as he walked, you must be hated as well. You must be mocked as well. Know and recognize that's part of what it means to be a Christian. And take joy in it instead of complaining. Take joy in it instead of complaining. How this should be an encouragement to you to trust in him, to believe upon him. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, once again, we, we think about your great sacrifice, your great obedience, your perfect life, you taking the curse in our place. We bless your name. Today we help, help us this morning to hear the irony, to see the irony in the situation, and not just to hear the, your enemies' voices, not just see what your enemies have done. Help us to see what you have done. Help us, please use this, this, uh, this short time, Lord, to save people here and to sanctify your saints. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you and glorify you. So we pray, Lord, we put this uh, this time in your hands for you to uh, be at work through your word. And we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen.